Hello, this is Louie Janet. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, that's really good. Okay, so welcome to video number eight in fluid mechanics. So this is the second video now in section three. Uh, and in the previous video, we looked at the conservation of mass. So that was like mass balances over control volume. So keeping track of the fluids flowing in and out of control volumes. And now we're gonna do the momentum equation, which is actually force balances uh, over these control volumes. Okay, so here's the breakdown of section three again. So you can see how this subsection fits in. So we're gonna do 3.4. In this video, uh, momentum equation for an inertial control volume. And a reminder, again, as I always do, that this goes hand in hand with example 3.2. Normally, I would have done that as one video here, but it's really important, I think, to see the examples done to really understand, you know, how this material is used and how it's applied. Okay, so let's get to it. This section is titled Momentum Equation for Inertial Control Volume. Let's just look at that first. We remember that Newton's second law is actually saying that the balance of forces is actually the time rate of change of the linear momentum. So this is why we have momentum equation, because when we talk about momentum, we're actually relating the forces. So we can think of those as interchangeable, momentum and forces. And then inertial control volume. We're fine with control volume. This whole chapter is about control volumes. But what does the inertial mean? Okay, so inertial means not accelerating. So we're going to look first at control volumes that are at rest. But then we're going to follow that also with looking at control volumes that are moving with a constant velocity because those are also not accelerating. So in an upcoming section, we're going to look at the accelerating control volumes and we'll see why we have to treat those differently. Essentially, there's just an extra term in the equation. But for now, we're going to be looking at the inertial ones. So before we start marching through the math, let's just first talk about where this is applicable. So when do we use the force balances for inertial control volumes? These would be the cases for things like pipe fittings or the fire hose, for example, because they're non-accelerating versus, for example, the accelerating frames, well, that'd be something like the rocket. When a rocket blasts off from the earth, it accelerates. So we consider those in a separate section. So in this section, we do only the non-accelerating ones, like pipe fittings. Okay, so up top, we have here our system balance again, and that is just Newton's second law, which we've thought of as force equals mass times acceleration, but force equals mass times acceleration is the simplification we use when something has a constant mass. So for our control volumes, when we can have mass entering it and exiting, we use the full form of Newton's second law, which is that the force is equal to the rate of change of the linear momentum. Okay, we've also seen that the external forces are split into surface and body forces, so that's shown here. Okay, and this is the expression we have here that's relative to control volumes. The same type of thing we did in the mass balance I'm not showing a full derivation of this, but we can see the essence of this equation is that we've taken what's applicable to linear momentum relative to a system, and now we're just factoring in that for a control volume, we actually have mass crossing the boundaries. So we need a term that accounts for any of this linear momentum that's essentially gonna be crossing these boundaries from the mass that enters or exits our control volume. Newton's second law tells us that that's equal to the sum of the external forces. Then we can equate all the external forces that act on our system we can say that those are the same as all the external forces acting on our control volume. So then subbing that in, the external forces are the surface and body forces. Then this next term here, we pause and take a look if we can figure out what that is just by analyzing the terms. So we're integrating over the control volume. We're integrating rho dv. So that represents the mass located within the control volume times the velocity at each point within the control volume. And our integral, we can think of like a summation. And we have a time rate of change out front. So that ends up representing the rate of change of the linear momentum of all the matter that's within the control volume. And that has to balance with the final term there, which we know is gonna be the momentum change because of the mass that flows either inwards or out of our control volume across these control surfaces, we call them. So we just take a quick look at that term there, make sure we can understand what's going on. So we've seen some of these before. So that rho v dot dA grouping there is m dot mass flow rate. Then we have mass flow rate times velocity integrated over all the control surfaces. So Therefore, that's looking at the amount of momentum that's entering or exiting the control volume. So the momentum change due to that mass flow rate. Okay, so we box this. That's one of the expressions we can use to solve. Now I'll pop this equation at the top of a fresh slide here, because as we did previously for the mass balance, we can also make some simplifications to this equation. So in cases, it will be easier to use. Okay, so it's very critical for us to remember when an integration is required. So an integration is required anytime these terms within the integral are changing over the range that we're integrating. 
So in this term specifically here, if we don't experience a change in velocity or density over the area, now remember in many cases we do, but if we substitute in there, for example, an average value that's representative of the value across the whole area, we don't need to do the integration over the area. So that's a pretty common circumstance in these engineering problems. So we can then simplify just to the summation form below there, and that's written as uniform flow at the inlets and exits, so down here. So that's the one we can use when we have an average value or a uniform flow value across our inlets and exits. As per usual, we have to be aware, be very cognizant of this V dot A or V dot DA grouping here. We remember there's a direction associated with that, so that's how we get the direction in this equation, which is a vector equation. We take a look at each of those terms, they're a vector. So when we take that dot product, that will solve for our direction or, or account for our direction, it's a better way to say it. And we remember that the velocity times the area or the V dot DA actually corresponds to our volumetric flow rate given as Q. So another shortcut we might come across, many problems will give us the Q value. So if we recognize that term that I've put in brackets there in the yellow, we may not have to solve anything there. That, we may just be able to substitute in our Q value. As long as we get the direction correct, that's going to correspond to our Q value. And likewise, this expression right here, rho times V dot DA, we've seen that before too. That's mass flow rate. We'll see how this comes up in some of the future examples too, but you might also be given the mass flow rate, and so that will also simplify the solving of this equation. Okay, and the other remaining terms that we've seen in that equation we've seen before. So body forces, that's gravity. So to find the gravity, we integrate rho G over our control volume, and that's just the weight of the control volume also written as capital MG, where capital M is the total mass of the control volume. Now in many applications, the surface forces are going to be pressure. So the pressure can be acting along the surface of this control volume. We've seen this before to calculate the pressure forces, we just take the pressure times the area, and the negative sign there, we're just making sure that we're consistent with our directions here because the pressure will be acting against the surfaces of our control volume. Okay, so because that's a vector equation, I've broken it out into its component form here. The component form here is much more commonly how we're gonna be solving these problems. So we'll set up our coordinate axes and then in most cases we'll solve, for example, in X and Y directions. So it's important to note that the V velocity values we subbed in here correspond to the velocity only in the given direction when V was given as a vector. But then we notice importantly the V dot DA, we have kept the V expression there. That's because the dot product is a scalar, so it's important to remember that we should complete that as a dot product and not just sub in the x direction value there. The direction is taken care of with the dot product already. We'll see that in examples as well. And then we just write that again. In many cases we'll have uniform velocity, so that final integral on the end there will be a summation instead. And then one more point is just when we're looking at this one term here, so all those guys are rate of change, so the partial derivative with, with respect to t, and we remember the way steady state's defined. So steady state actually defines the time rate of changes as being equal to zero. So many, many problems will have steady state. We remember that that term can be set to zero for the steady state flow. Now this is something that I think is really best to illustrate with an example. And so I've done example 3.2, which is now in a separate video. But remember, make sure to watch that because it really does go hand in hand with the material we're seeing here. And this is really one of those cases where I think the example is probably a better way of demonstrating like really what this equation means and how we use it to solve problems. Okay, now before we go to an example of this, we'll take a look at control volumes when they're moving with a constant velocity. So the constant velocity control volumes and the stationary control volumes are really the same thing. So long as there's no acceleration, we can just do the exact same analysis. It's just important here to just be keeping track of which reference frame we're referring to. So what I mean by that, we'll look at these two different coordinate systems that it's set up here. So referring to this figure here, we have an absolute reference frame or a stationary reference frame, which is capital X, capital Y. And then our control volume is drawn around this cart that's moving to the right with the velocity U. So we have this other reference frame here that's a lowercase y, lowercase x. And you'll notice textbooks like to draw this little um, dancing stick figure person here. So that's just really denoting that the reference frame is from the perspective of someone that's sitting on the control volume, so they're moving with it at a constant velocity. So that, that guy there just denotes that the frame is moving, and we're looking at it through his reference point. So I'll write out at the left here how we reference these two different uh, reference frames. And then our analysis is exactly the same. It's just what we're gonna do is 
denote explicitly which coordinate system we're referring to. So we have to do our force balance relative to our control volume reference frame. So that's where our changing momentum values, that's where they're relevant to. So you'll notice the equation is identical. We just put this little x, y, z lowercase on the velocity values there. So we have exactly the same equation. It's just we're reminding ourselves that it's relative to this reference frame that's moving with a constant velocity. So just a really quick mini example here to demonstrate that. So based on our figure at the right here, we have this cart that's moving to the right and you have this nozzle shown at the left here. That's relative to our stationary frame. So the nozzle's fixed in the stationary frame there and it's shooting a spray of water out at velocity V. So let's just say that's at 30 meters per second. We've got velocity U, which denotes how fast the cart is moving to the right. Let's say for the sake of this quick example, that's 10 meters per second. But at the edge of our control volume, what we're gonna need there is the value for V1. So I'll sketch it out here and I just want you to make sure that you connect with what's V1. So v one's gonna be relative to our control volume reference frame. Okay, so you've had a second to think about it. Probably most of you figured this out. If not, pause it. Otherwise, I'm gonna write it out here. Okay, so 20 meters per second, that's the one that's relative to our lowercase x, y, z. So that's what we'd use in our calculations. And that's 20 meters per second. All right, so you can see that's exactly the same as the calculation we did last time. It's just when it's moving with constant velocity, it's more of a bookkeeping thing. Just make sure all your velocities are relative to that moving control volume frame. Otherwise, it's just exactly the same as the analysis for the stationary control volumes. Okay, so you might be looking at this thinking, when am I ever going to actually have a control volume moving with a constant velocity? And this little example of a cart with wheels on it uh, is uh, probably not much help to you because uh, I don't know how many times in uh, our engineering practice we're going to want to uh, move <laughs> carts along with a, with a stationary um, spray of water uh, that move with a constant velocity. So, so that isn't a lot of help to us. Okay, so not to worry. This is actually quite applicable. And when I think about it, one of the ones that comes to mind is turbines. So in an earlier video, in video seven, I showed a few examples and I'll show this video again here. So this is actually showing what's called a Pelton turbine. And that's a type of impulse turbine. And these are used in situations where you have a high pressure water source. So what we're seeing in this shot here is each of these blue things, high pressure water is piped down into each of these nozzles. The blue things are showing the nozzles. So it sprays a water jet forward that hits each of the scoops, the silver scoops there on the actual turbine. I got this video online from this Voith company showing presumably one of their Pelton turbines. For example, the water supply source here could be like a dam. Okay, so it's when we want to convert, we have all this high pressure water and we want to convert that into something useful. So we rotate this turbine and typically turn that into electricity. But if we look at it, so because this is spinning, all of these scoops on this wheel, they're spinning. What happens is the nozzle that's stationary, of course, shoots water out and it hits these scoops that are moving at a roughly a constant velocity, right? So let me zoom right in here. I'll zoom right in and then I'm just gonna sketch this out just so we convert it into a format. It's easy to see what's going on. So first I'll trace the nozzle here and show the water. This is the, where the water jet would be coming. And in the video, you probably saw these scoops are actually fairly sophisticated. They can have quite complicated shapes. Um, so this water can actually pass like through a little opening that's cut in the scoops here. So I'll, I'll trace the scoop, put a control volume around it. So that's what we'd be analyzing to keep the same notation in the previous figure I had. I'll call, I'll say the water is moving with this velocity V, but the scoop is moving to the right with this uh, constant velocity U. Now I'll just quickly sketch a few more things. You're probably wondering, like as the water hits it, it also is redirected back out. And that's why the shapes of these things can be complex. And so sometimes it comes straight back out, but in a different plane, like for example, like it might be above or below where that water stream is hitting it. So I'll just draw it over top here. Uh, and then it could also be angled in some cases. And so you'd analyze that as part of your control volume as well. Really depends on the complexity and shape of each of these uh, little scoops, like I've been calling them. And so, and so there you have it, right? So that's exactly the kind of scenario we would be describing with the force balance we developed in this section. And that hopefully is a more uh, applicable type of situation. Okay, so for a quick summary, in this video, we looked at how you do force balances over control volumes. So in the context of fluid mechanics, what we're doing is looking at how you account for forces when you have mass 
that exits or enters a control volume. We saw we did that by keeping track of the momentum. And so the momentum we have that crosses the boundaries. So we looked at control volumes that are at rest. And then we saw that control volumes moving with a constant velocity is basically exactly the same. We just have to really keep track of our velocities and our reference frame. And now I'll remind you yet again, check out the example because I think it's a great way to see really what this equation means and how we use it. In force balances, they're very important in engineering. Bye-bye.